Great. Uh, well, thanks for coming along. Um, I could tell you lots of things about myself. Probably the most uh, interesting from the point of view of today's talk is that I am working at the Australian National University in Canberra. Um, I'm the Chief IT Officer in the what was the Department of Computer Science. This year it's become the School of Computer Science. I've been there for about nine years and one of my responsibilities is to maintain a database which we use for many administrative functions and primarily um, for keeping track of student marks uh, and all sorts of aspects to do with our teaching um, efforts uh, in terms of assessments and giving grades out. <coughs> um, so I put in a talk proposal about some work I've been doing for a couple of years. The, the database which we're basing this on has been in operation for about eight years now. Um, but over the last few years I've been investigating uh, alternative ways of arranging the data. And uh, one of the, uh, the outcomes is, I guess, a talk proposal which I put together. And I was hoping I'd get a little bit more of the work done before we came here. But uh, I did get some more done, but not as much as I'd hoped. We'll talk about where it's up to so far. Um, so I'm going to talk about the uh, how most LAMP models work, um, motivation for changing it, a bit about PostgreSQL, which needs more capitalization there, um, then a bit about authentication and access control, hierarchical groupings, views, function triggers, you can read all there. Uh, this is the first time I've given a talk using any form of PowerPoint or OpenOffice, normally I use HTML directly and I thought it'd be different this time. And I must admit I've struggled a bit with the technology and I hate dot points, but that's just how it all came together in the end. <coughs> Sorry about that. So with the traditional LAMP model, um, LAMP stands for, uh, for those of you who may not be aware, um, Linux, Apache, MySQL, and the P can stand for a number of things. Perl, Python, PHP. Um, some people modify it to the acronym to be Linux, Apache, Middleware, and PostgreSQL. Um, and not to be confused with WIMP, Windows, IIS, MySQL, and Perl, or PHP. And um, it's the traditional paradigm for most web-based applications, including, uh, I, I understand, Wikipedia is based on a LAMP paradigm. Um, and Facebook and you name it, all those sorts of big things uh, are all um, basically running on Linux servers with Apache and MySQL and uh, or, or PostgreSQL and some middleware. <coughs> um, when you write a, a typical LAMP style application, um, the general idea is that the database being used to store your data in the back end um, will have one user um, that gets used to do all operations in the database. So the middleware, your code that's presenting your, uh, your web pages out, will connect to the database as some privileged user, which would have the um, permissions to create tables and um, do all the operations, all selects, inserts, updates, deletes, etc. everything that needs to be done for that web application. It has basically full access to the database. And it's up to the application itself to uh, impose some kind of access control to decide who can see which pages. Um, when you read your emails using Gmail or whatever, make sure that you're reading your email and not someone else's. Make sure you can't read someone else's email, even though as far as the database is concerned, it's just one user asking for emails and it'll give them any email at once that, that it gets asked for. That's a fairly standard way of doing things. And it works and it's simple. Um, it's fast, um, and clearly lots of applications use it. <coughs> so the new model, well, it's not that new. Um, the, the model which we're looking at here is that the uh, web applications and other applications will attempt to connect the database as the particular user is logging in. So when you log into your, your website, uh, give a username and password, uh, those, that username and password gets passed on or whatever authentication information it might be, so maybe it's a, a Kerberos ticket, gets passed straight to the database. And the database now has some strong notion of who it is um, that's, that's accessing the data. And it then does all the access control internally. So it provides the middleware back with only um, the data that that particular user is allowed to view 
or to um, to do updates and modifiers, etc. It's not really a new paradigm at all. So uh, the slide says new. Um, this is actually the way that uh, big iron type database apps, um, Medibank or whatever, the big uh, the big the big databases that run um, all those sorts of things, banks, etc. Do things using um, using per user access to the database rather than a single a single user. <coughs> and they've been doing that for a while. So there's nothing new about this, just uh, this is the way that I've been looking at doing it. Um, have I missed a slide? Nope. Okay. Motivation for change. So this, the system which I've been working on for a number of years, about, uh, about eight years since we started working on it, or a bit over that now, um, it's now known as the Faculty Administrative Information System, although that term is now out of date because we no longer have a faculty, we have a college, so it's probably going to be called the College Admin Information System sooner or later. And it has a single PostgreSQL database in the back end, and it has multiple applications that access that database. So unlike a, perhaps most LAMP applications where there's just one application that, that accesses the database, what we have has mi multiple applications. There's several different web interfaces, one for students to use, one for tutors to use, one for lecturers and staff to use, and a fourth one for administrative administrators to use. And that's all you know, a bit complicated, a bit hard to maintain perhaps. There are also some non-web-based applications. We have um, background jobs that are involved in synchronising some of our data against the university databases that keep track of enrolment data. And um, we have... Um, bits of code that are written in C that do fancy things with the data when students submit assignments and stuff like that. So we have, uh, and also some of our lecturers have written code in Java that um, allows them to automatically mark students' um, papers and um, insert the marks directly back in the database. So we have bits of code written in, uh, most of it's written in PHP, probably about 30, 35,000 lines. And then there's chunks of Perl and Python in there, which I didn't write. Um, C code, which I did write, and Java, written by some of our, our other staff. <coughs> and some of our IT app savvy users are asking to be able to write other applications that can talk to the database, uh, or to just simply have access to the data so they can um, run historical um, analyses of how the data is going with student grades and stuff like that. And it's very hard to give them that access because of the... Uh, the ability that they would have perhaps to um, get access to data they shouldn't see that exists in the same tables, so um, private sort of privacy information there, or um, to they may uh, need to be able to write some or update some tables, but giving them the ability to update the table would actually allow them to corrupt um, other information. So we need to be very careful about how we do that. <coughs> so we're interested in imposing privacy and integrity of the data. Um, how can we do that, um, giving people access to our database? Um, some use cases, there's lots of different ways in which uh, different people will interact with this database during the course of a normal day. Um, for some bizarre historical reason, our online forums for student teaching all exist in the same database, and so we have um, staff and students uh, posting messages onto the forums. Um, some of the forums only the staff can post or only particular staff can post into. Um, the lecturers might have a, an announcement forum where they can make announcements, but uh, students can't actually reply to those announcements. Uh, other forums are discussion type forums where students will be um, discussing things back and forth, posting things. Some of the forums allow emails automatically when there's a new posting, others don't, etc. So there's a mixture of staff and students accessing those forums. Uh, a second special, or well, a second sort of case that uh, that uh, I need to keep be cognizant of when we're uh, designing this is students registering to small groups, small group teaching, such as lab groups, tutorial groups, etc. Now, in this situation, we need students to be able to update data in the database um, for the, for their small groups, and uh, that that data may exist in the same tables as um, information that might, for example, um, indicate which courses they're doing. And so we again need to be careful not to let them modify the wrong parts, the wrong, the wrong rows of the table. <coughs> uh, 
Um, student marks is an interesting one. Students um, generally can't change marks, obviously, um, but there are some situations where students do self-assessment. We generally do that using a separate table so that they don't have direct access to the main marks table. But we want them to be able to read their own marks, or some of their own marks, not all their own marks. There's some marks which, um, exam marks for example, which uh, the lecturers for one reason or another might decide to keep hidden um, for a time at least. Um, tutors need to be able to update marks, but only update marks for their own particular small groups. Lecturers need to be able to update marks across uh, the entire course. Administrators generally don't need to update marks, but need to be able to read read them to be able to um, do analysis and stuff like that. So there's all sorts of different ways in which um, different people are trying to access the student marks and uh, we need to restrict what they can do. <coughs> and there's lots of other things. One of the, uh, the important things of course with a database like this is privacy. So even revealing to students which other students might be in particular small groups um, is in breach of the Commonwealth privacy laws which the Australian National University comes under and I guess most states, most other universities will be under similar state laws. Um, <coughs> so, you know, we need to be careful that some guy doesn't come into the class and see some, you know, gorgeous girl there and instead of going and talking to her, decides he's going to go and hack in the database and find out what he can just to impress her with his uh, skills and, uh, you know, whatever. Um, that was obviously be a breach of privacy. Um, so things like that which we need to keep Keep uh, keep control over. Just stop me any time if you want to ask a question or. Um, yeah, so this project, which we're talking about, started about nine years ago. At the time, we needed a database that had foreign keys, functions, and views. Do people know what they are, or do people need? Okay, good. Um, all right. So. <coughs> I'll start with views because they're probably the simplest. Um, a view is a way of representing a uh, join of some tables or some data in some tables um, as a new query. So instead of um, revealing the underlying um, rows from tables, you can select particular columns from some tables, join them together in a particular way, and make that uh, look like a new table, a virtual table. Um, generally, you can't update it. You update the, the underlying tables, and the view just gives you a particular um, subset of what that data might look like. One of the important things of views is that you can use different permissions on the views for accessing the data than for the underlying data. So the underlying data might belong to one user and not have any ability to be read or updated by anyone else. Um, the view can belong to that owner, the, the person who owns the data, but it can get grant access to other people. So you can say, um, I'm going to let certain people see these columns of this particular join of information rather than all the underlying information. So they're, they're useful both for giving simplified queries to, um, to the applications but also for imposing a slightly different um, permissions regime. Um, functions in PostgreSQL, um, you can write functions in lots of different languages including C and even Tickle I think. Um, Python for sure. <coughs> um, but um, like Oracle, Postgres has a built in language called um, PGSQL, and um, it allows you to uh, write things basically in SQL with loops and conditionals and all sorts of things like that that can be run um, during query time. So you can actually pull data out of a table and um, manipulate it in some way perhaps check it for consistency before you actually allow an update or a, um, or a um, insert or a delete. That's more to do with triggers, but functions are part of that. So just programmatic, way, programmatic things that can happen inside the database. I believe that uh, MySQL does that as well these days, but I think nine years ago it didn't. <coughs> foreign keys, I'm um, sort of doing some reverse order. Foreign keys, yep. Yeah. What 
Well, as you'll see, just about the entire thing I'm talking about will depends on the use of functions, and it is the functions are hard to maintain, hard to hard to develop, hard to debug, and you, if you're doing it on a live database, um, you need to be extremely careful. Um, yeah, so I mean, everything I'm talking about here is not trivial, um, and one of the slides towards the end, I'll talk about some of the uh, some of the downsides of w of this, and one of them is it violates the KISS principle. Um, functions are a problem. If you're if you're dealing with them um, correctly, they're usually not too much of a problem. Uh, I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, foreign keys. Foreign keys just basically says that um, a value in a column in one table uh, must exist in a column in some other table. So, for example, a student ID. Before you can put a student ID in the mark table, the um, database will make sure that that student ID actually exists in the student table. So that you're actually talking about a real student, not some um, mistaken ID, etc. So, foreign keys are just there. Um, to make sure that the data is always integral. And it also helps um, if you deleted the student, you wouldn't be able to because the tables that were referencing that student ID would all complain and say, um, if you delete that student, then uh, the value of this column is becomes uh, illegal. And so you're basically prevented from deleting the student until you delete all of the other records and the other tables that refer back to that student. So. Um, they're kind of good like that. They stop you accidentally doing things. And they're very important for, um, for what I'm going to discuss, where you're actually giving, potentially giving everybody direct access to the database. You need to make sure that people don't accidentally delete things they shouldn't delete. Certainly. Um, I don't know. I really don't know much about MySQL, I'm afraid. There are some MySQL people here. Um, I suspect that. It probably, I know, th I'm pretty certain that nine years ago when we looked at all this stuff, it didn't do it. There was no such thing as a foreign key. I would be surprised if that was still the case. Um, certainly, um, you know, it's certainly a, a feature of most um, large scale databases. Oracle and. I beg your pardon? It's part of the ANSI standard, yeah, but MySQL doesn't necessarily. Referential, yeah, it's referential integrity. Yep. Refer so when you write it, you say, you know, this key rep references this particular column in some other table. Um, uh, so they're the things we needed back then, and we ch we we chose to go with PostgreSQL. Um, it basically did everything we wanted to do. It was open source in particular. Um, Oracle was an option. We did have a license to run Oracle, and uh, we could have done it that way. I'm kind of glad we didn't. Um, in the in the meantime, we've also come across situations where we wanted to use triggers, and the other thing which we uh, which this whole paradigm which I'm going to describe relies on is the ability for the database to um, have a concept of many multiple users. So having a user uh, table inside the database that um, describes all the different users who can connect in. Okay, so the uh, the easy the low hanging fruit here is authentication. Authentication is easy compared to access control, relatively, um, <coughs> and you can't do access control without having a robust notion of authentication. So you can't really restrict Bob from reading a table unless you're really sure that it is actually Bob who's connected in and not someone pretending to be Bob. So um, PostgreSQL has this notion of current user or session user or um, th the the person who's actually um, been authenticated across the connection that's come in, and so that helps us a lot. And we can actually use that to join um, a lot of our queries together, and uh, and therefore impose um, in our views what informations are allowed to be uh, viewable. Postgres itself has several authentication methods. So once you try and connect in with the username and password. Um, it has various ways it can authenticate you. So one of them is using a password file uh, on the disk. That's obviously um, hard to securely modify or to update using a web application or whatever. So it's there, but uh, we don't use it. The, um, the one which I have been using a lot, but only while I'm testing, is the built-in um, tables that Postgres has in the system, where it keeps passwords and stuff 
in an actual table which makes adding users and changing their passwords trivial. It can be done using standard queries provided you have um, sufficient privileges to update and modif uh, update those particular tables. Um, so that makes it quite straightforward. You, there's no out of database, um, out of band if you like, um, access requirements to create new users or to change their passwords. Um, PostgreSQL also has the ability to call out to an LDAP server or, or some PAM service to authenticate a user. So a um, lot of power there. And there's no particular reason, although the talk is talking about authenticating users against the database, um, it, there's nothing to say the database can't then authenticate against some other central um, authentication system like LDAP, which is how we would probably want to see it being used. Um, Kerberos is even more interesting because with Kerberos, um, you don't need to continuously provide username and password every time you do a, um, a new connection. You can just simply pass a ticket to the database and the ticket uh, will expire in a certain amount of time but uh, the database then has everything it needs to authenticate you and to, um, to let you go ahead and so uh, that would have a performance uh, impact I should think uh, over LDAP where it relies on the LDAP server being able to respond quickly to an authentication request. And there are other things in there as well. Um, but basically, it's a rich. Sorry? That's another downside of this whole thing is if you want to reuse connections. So there are ways, of, there are some ways around that, but yeah, basically using persistent connections. Um, so I guess all of, all of the bindings to a database would do it, but I know the PHP ones in particular do. Um, we'll check the username and password that you're trying to access the database as. If it's already got a connection with that username and password or that's already established for that user, it will reuse it persistently. Um, if it doesn't, then it creates a new connection. Yep. Yeah. There you go. No, I'm provided there are enough enough users, yeah. But the 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 bindings at the language end, the, the script end would have to also know that the persistent if you're using a persistent connection that it's already got one that's open. It is an issue. You do need to keep an eye on how many concurrent users you have and how many threads. If there are, you know, each thread wants to maintain its own persistent connection. Um, it generally doesn't matter to use non-persistent connections. There's so many database operations going on in a particular web page that just doing a new connection each time doesn't really cost a lot by comparison. But yeah, that's another thing you'll see in my uh, slide at the end is that there's a performance issue with persistent connections. Okay, so access control. So we've covered authentication. The database knows who we are. Now we want to be able to find a way of restricting what sort of things we can do to the database um, in a programmatic way, a way that can be um, done within the database itself. And we obviously prefer a model um, which is sufficiently generic that, uh, that we can represent it with um, SQL functions. It doesn't have to be sort of too complicated. Um, we can reuse the functions and uh, don't have to write lots and lots of special purpose ones for every single case. Didn't quite make that goal, but um, we're sort of getting there. <coughs> and obviously it makes sense if the same model um, or data use the access control represents actual organisation of people in your organisation. So you don't have two separate um, sets of data there. You don't have your database representing you know who's whose boss and what their job role is and everything else and then a separate set of data that says um, this person's able to do this and that and everything else it helps if you can actually merge that together and say well if this person's a departmental administrator then they're able to do all these things straight away without having two separate sets of, um, of information there which can easily go out of synchronization so somebody might have their role changed temporarily for a while you then if you have a separate um, a separate system for controlling accesses, then you need to update that as well, and then they change back, and you forget to change the accesses or whatever, and things go to sync. So we're trying hard here to um, use the same information the database uses to represent what people's um, roles are within the organisation against what uh, accesses they're allowed to do in the database.
Um, no. No. If HR say that they've got this new role, and that new role is defined to allow them to do whatever, then it's not my responsibility to say, I'm sorry, that person just simply can't do that. I've got to say, well, you've chosen it. <laughs> we have backups, we keep logs, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, <coughs> we've got to trust the HR people. Um, I went to a talk by, I saw him walk in. Hi. Um, on uh, Monday, you're doing a talk for, what was? Kaigo, Kaigo Kohai. Now, He's from Japan, is he, or Tokyo, yeah. So he's apparently proposed or had accepted, I'm not sure what the status of, did a bit of research on the web, these Postgres access control extensions. That's his work, isn't it, or PGACE? Right. Right, I saw his name in there amongst a lot of it, so. Right. So, um, this is something I need to look at. Um, the, the, there is a proposed um, set of access control extensions, which I wasn't aware of before Monday, um, for PostgreSQL, and I need to have a look and see um, what the framework looks like. And obviously, that may actually end up changing a lot of what, I've, what I'm going to talk about now, because it doesn't make sense for me to go off in a different direction to the rest of the Postgres uh, body. I haven't read it. <laughs> um, but I can tell you a bit about PG Postgres SE Linux. Is that right or is that the other way around? SE Linux Postgres, I can't remember. SE Postgres. Right. Um, so uh, I, I, I tried to get that to compile on my machine, but uh, something's changed between his instructions and the current, um, the current standard, the current uh, snapshots in the. Um, Postgres download area, so I couldn't actually have a good look at it. As I understand it, with uh, from what was discussed on Monday, that um, as uh, you perform particular queries on particular tables and columns and rows, etc., um, post th this um, security enhanced Postgres will uh, do callouts to the SE Linux framework and check whether or not you actually have the capability to do that and. Uh, that's all very interesting. Um, I'm pretty sure that it's not that interesting to me because I need to be able to easily modify or to look up what people are able to do and modify it from within the database um, and do it in a, a coherent manner that's um, maintainable with, within the, uh, the functions, etc. that are available in the database. I don't really want to have a totally separate system sitting outside the database which would need to be dynamically updated in a secure way. But I'm happy to look at that further. Um, these are just two things which I've come across in the last few days, uh, and I'm quite happy that I was able to uh, find out about those. <coughs> so in trying to sort this out, I initially trialled a system using role capability area model. So each user um, is allowed one or more roles in one or more areas. So I might be, for example, the Chief IT Officer in the School of Computer Science, but I may also be a visiting lecturer in um, School of Chemistry or something like that. So I may have different roles in different areas. Um, for each role, I may have one or more capabilities. So as a Chief IT Officer, of course, I have all capabilities because I'm God. But um, as a lecturer or a Department Administrator or something, I might have uh, capabilities to do HR updates or to do um, um, you know, changing student marks for, for my courses, etc. And that kind of uh, model neatly reflects the way staff are organised, so uh, we can basically take the mapping of how staff are organised within the organisation and map it directly into roles and areas and then add the capabilities for those roles and areas directly. And that looks pretty good. <coughs> There were some issues with getting clean SQL functions, given the, um, in a sense, three pieces of information that are required for, for each access, um, the role capability in area, um, working out which area a particular piece of data belonged in. Um, there were some issues with hierarchy of roles, so 
um, people who are doing um, one particular role in one area might also have responsibility to see, um, have visibility over data that belongs to some other role in another area, a sub-area, a, a sort of an underlying area, and that was hard to, to model as well. Um, but the main issue, the main problem where I came unstuck with this particular schema was to do with student data. So students, it's very hard to identify an area. Uh, their role is obviously student, but um, which area do they belong in? We could create a separate area for every course, but then we also want to be able to control what students can do at the small group sort of level, which is like a sub, a sub area of a course, if you like. And again, we have the same sorts of problems. So the whole thing came unstuck. Remember this whole database was designed about um, student access as well as um, staff. And so um, the whole thing didn't work. I didn't discover that for some months after I started coding it up. And uh, when I sort of started working on the student stuff, I realized I got a big problem. <coughs> so what I came up with instead is hierarchical groups. Um, and that model is looking a lot more promising. So each person, whether it be a user or a non-user, so we do have non-user people in our database, for example, book authors, um, contacts within companies, um, people who we need to know of something about, but they don't actually ever log into our database. Um, we put each of those people into their own group, and each group can then belong to one or more other groups. So you can have multiple parents and multiple children. There's a sort of structure we have. Each group um, is not allowed to have a loop, so you, you can't have a group that is a child of another group, which might end up being the parent of the group you're just about to join onto. We don't want that. Um, and then we allow accesses based on which group you're in. So if you're a member of one group, you're also a member of all the groups above that group. Beg your pardon? All oh right, during uh, inserts and updates, we have a test that says, um, is the group that we're about to add the, as a parent um, a child of us? Yep. So there's a trigger, a trigger that does that. Um, so I had a look at the current 8.3 um, stable version of Postgres and the new version. And they seem to have changed something slightly, but 8.2, which is what I was developing on um, more recently, um, has a similar, very similar concept in its user tables. The user, the user is actually, PG underscore user is actually a view into, uh, or was a view into a table called PG underscore roles. And roles had another table sitting next to it, whose name I've currently forgotten, that allowed, um, allowed each role to be Actually, yeah, no, they had a very strict hierarchy. Each each uh, role could only have one parent role, so um, it was a very strict hierarchy. And if you're in one role, you could grant um, you could grant access to you know update access if you like to one table to a particular role, and everyone who was in a role under that role was able to um, to do that update. So you could um, I they had this hierarchical thing working in there. Um, unfortunately, you can't do foreign key references against the system tables. At least you couldn't. I don't know if you can now. I haven't tried. But um, it means that it's hard to uh, verify that the roles that um, I'm using in the main part of the database actually exist in the system tables. And also, I wanted to add a whole lot of extra stuff to each group to say um, who was allowed to do inserts, who was allowed to administrate, or change the name of the group, and all this other sort of stuff. So. There's a lot of extra information, a lot of um, metadata for each group that needs to be tagged in, um, which they didn't have. And so basically ended up replicating their system. But I do actually reference it because I need to know what the user's login name is when they log in. So I ended up with three core tables. And because my drawing skills with this new open office technology is hopeless, um, I decided I'm just going to draw it on the whiteboard instead. So this is. Uh, a Bob Edwards style entity relationship diagram, um, which probably doesn't fit anyone's standard, but doesn't matter. Uh, and I can't write while I'm holding a microphone for some reason. 
Now I lecture and uh, normally I lecture in networking, not databases, and uh, I always draw when I'm lecturing. So I have this these three tables: um, group, member, and member has a parent and a child, which are both foreign key references into the group ID. And we have a person which has a PID and the PID is actually a GID. In some sense you could say this person table inherits from the group table but it only inherits the, the, the uh, group ID, it doesn't inherit all the other stuff. But in actual fact they're two separate tables and um, this value here must exist over here but it's also unique. So you can only have, um, a particular group can only have one person in it. Um, and we have in here also login name, which if it could be foreign key reference to the session user it would be, but uh, it can't be. So we just simply match the uh, session user or current user against this login name. And we have other details in here like, um, you know, your actual name, date of birth, um, all that sorts of stuff you want to know about a person. Well, foreign keys are triggers. They're inf they're actually yeah. done with triggers. But um, when you say when you say this references that, it creates a trigger and does everything for you. You don't have to actually go and create a function. Um, so going in this direction, making sure that when you have one person in each group that's done with a foreign key reference. But going the other way, you want to make sure that you don't, once a person's in a group, you want to you make sure that before you put a person in the group that there's no children of that group because that would violate one person per group. So we have, a f we have a insert update rule trigger that says before I allow um, any change on this value here, make sure that this group isn't a parent or it doesn't have a member, doesn't have a member which is a parent. And also, whenever we um, do a, an insert update on this table, we make sure that we don't um, set a parent to a group that's also got a person. So these are all um, primary keys, and so they've all got indexes and fast lookups and all that sort of stuff. So uh, it doesn't take too long to do that. <coughs> so they're the three. They're the three core tables that uh, everything else basically hangs off. And this group table actually has lots of uh, other fields in it and at this point in time on page 14 um, we can actually have a look at it if I can remember where I put it uh, so that's what it sort of currently looks like um, except you can't see it all because for some reason the external monitors different res. Okay, so group ID is the primary key. Um, groups have names, which is just a comment really that's not unique or anything. It just helps someone like me know which group it probably is. Um, there's stuff about when the group was created and who did it. And the create by is actually um, foreign key reference back to the group ID, so it has to be done by someone who's actually already in a group kind of has an interesting chicken and egg situation at the beginning. How do you create a group for the person who's creating the group? Um, but you can get around that. Um, we can expire groups. That's really to do with historical stuff. Then we have these other groups. Admin group, member ad group. Um, candidate groups and um, can list group. So these four, max size is really just um, a thing that gets used to make sure you don't get too many students enrolling in a small group and stuff like that. Um, but the admin group, that's the group of people who own this group. So it might be one person, the person who created it, or it might be a group of people, so a group of people who are allowed to actually go and change all of the fields in this group here, um, except the group ID, obviously. Um, the member ad group is a group of people who can self-add themselves um, into the group. So if you're in a member ad group, it means um, it's like a candidate of groups of leaf nodes or individual people who can then add themselves 
into this group and that's what we use for students doing uh, registrations so we simply say the um, the group member ad group is actually the group of all students in a course and so if you're a, a student in a course um, then you that the course group would then uh, become the the owner of the member ad and anyone in that group can then add themselves to this group and delete themselves as well but they're not able to because they're member ad that doesn't mean they're able to um, to uh, see who else is in the group that's kind of private information candidate group these are other groups that can add themselves so instead of individuals um, sorry groups that the admin can add to this group so um, it might be all groups there's a sort of a concept of all groups um, and there's also the final one is here there's, there's actually some others in the stuff I'm doing in Canberra I just put these here for us today the can list group is a list is a group of people who can um, see the, the leaf nodes of who's in the group so you can actually see the group IDs of all of the other members of the group um, again that's private information in some circumstances but in other circumstances um, it needs to be obviously people need to be able to see it so that's what the uh, group table looks like at the moment I was up to about 14, wasn't I? Uh, should have learned to press F5, shouldn't I? <coughs> okay, so underneath all this, the all the data in all these tables ends up belonging to one user, um, and that uses the well, can, it, it can be anybody but uh, at the moment it's the, um, the Postgres super user and um, it's not directly exposed to other users if we directly, directly exposed if we allowed much of the raw data to be publicly visible then um, we're basically allowing people to discover things about other people which perhaps you don't want them to now all this stuff sort of flies in the face a little bit with uh, yesterday morning's talk about being um, uh, generous or what, what was the word he used um, plentiful so giving people access to as much as you can um, unfortunately the reality of the world is in my mind anyway my, my world view is that people generally are pretty good but there are a few people who aren't and um, because there are a few people who might have other ideas about how they want to use this data we all have to pay a price and we all have to live with the extra cost of having restrictions on what we do and uh, that's just kind of what's going on here really it's a pity it's like that otherwise you just wouldn't have to worry about this at all we could just put all the data out there and let people play with it but it's why we have locks on our doors and banks and all that sort of stuff isn't it anyway so the data belongs to a super user we use views which we talked about earlier so we can expose some of the data to particular users using views and views like I said before are like pre-planned selects or not really pre-planned saying planned is a, a misnomer because it implies that the that the query plan has already planned it it hasn't it's a pre prepared um, sort of query and in those views we can join um, things against people's current um, username so we can uh, find out what they're actually allowed to see and uh, restrict the number of rows that get returned to what they're allowed to, to view and then we use these triggers and functions for doing the updates so in terms of who's allowed to up do an update um, we have trigger functions for, for doing all that and they need to look at those with that uh, group table I showed you earlier with all the other group things they need to say is the current user in this group if we're trying to do an update is it in this group if we're trying to do some kind of um, select etc um, the functions that get written in PostgreSQL can be set up to either run as the function definer there's a person who define the function so in the case of um, what we're talking about here maybe the Postgres super user um, would be the definer and that means that the function can get access to the underlying data and that means that anyone who can log in can run that function and get access to whatever that function does so it's a very dangerous thing to do um, but sometimes you need to do that because otherwise you wouldn't actually be able to see the data underneath five more minutes okay so I do um, and the other option is function invoker so whoever's invoking the function has a permission to read the data underneath and if the data underneath says no then the function can't run 
and compared to the traditional lamp model, so we're back to where we started from. Um, the middleware has a single user that it uses to access the database with, and it impl imp imposes all of the access control and authentication itself. We're doing the same thing, only now the single user is within the database, and the access control and authentication is also within the database, but the functions and views are basically the functions that you'd have in your application that determine what you can actually see down in the data and what you can change. Um, obviously to work through these groups you need to be able to recursively um, go through them. SQL, uh, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but as, as I understand it, SQL doesn't have any standard way of doing recursive um, querying. So we do need a function to do that and this is a recursive function. Um, Nathan, you mentioned earlier that uh, when you change a function it creates all sorts of problems. So the uh, the way, right, yeah, yeah, okay, in particular. One of the things you need to make sure of with Postgres is when you change a function, you use create or replace. If you don't use create or replace, the other option is to drop the function and then create a new function. If you do a drop and then a new create, you actually lose any views or other functions that were referencing that function automatically um, have to be redone themselves. You can go, you can look in the system tables and see which functions because they all have object IDs and just go. Well, you can you can write a view that looks in the system table um, if you're going to do a lot. So I haven't done it. Um, this is a, this is a function written in. Just I wanted to show you what a function looks like in um, Postgres. Um, we have an integer variable called par parent. Um, we have a, a loop so. This function here is going to return all of the group IDs of all the parent um, groups of the group that calls it. So the group that calls it's the parameter um, $1, which is an integer. So that's the group you're interested in. might be the group that you're currently in, or y your group. And then it'll find all of the parent groups and returns them. Um, one of the curious things, so it loops through, it loops through all of the um, parents of the current group returns each of those. This return next doesn't actually return anything, it just creates a, um, a buffer of values it's going to return and then it says keep going. For each one it then recursively goes and calls itself, it actually calls a different function but it should be calling itself um, to go and um, do the same thing again for each parent. And when it's finally got it all together, what you can't see at the bottom of the screen is the returns and ends. And the whole thing is defined as an SQL, um, as, as a P or PG SQL function language. Um, performance improvements. Um, running recursive functions with non-deterministic runtime for each access is a performance problem. Most accesses are reads, so data not changing. Maintain an index table for all groups, of all groups, that a currently connected user is a member of. So we have this table. Uh, I won't show it to you, but it basically says uh, when Bob logs in, um, his his um, PID is in, my, in this case would be one, and these are all the groups. So just the simple tuples, um, and so I can do a simple select on there and say, given that for user Bob um, is he in that group, and it's a simple indexed operation, it should be an order of one or similar order one operation. <laughs> You like getting to my next slides all the time, don't you? No, no, I'll, I'll talk to you in a tick, but I'll show you. Oh, there is an alternative, yeah. Um, no, it's good, thanks. Um, hopefully it's a fast operation because it's just a in, in direct index lookup. Um, and we do a triggered update at connection time. So when you actually do a connect, um, you need to run a particular update which goes and clears out all the stuff you were in and repopulates it with a simple, um, a simple call of that function. Um, an alternative, not, your, not what you're going to suggest, um, keep the flat file current all the time so every time you do an update or an insert on your member table you recreate a flat file. Unfortunately you'd have to do that across all users because you don't know uh, what other users are going to be affected and that's going to be a huge table um, and it could take a long time to update it each time. So the way I do it is to only do it for the current user who's logged in, look at the groups that they're in that's all we're really interested in. We're not interested in what groups other people who aren't logged in at the moment are in. 
Um, hacking post ritual handy to it would be handy to automatically create a normalized list of member groups at connection at database connection time without having to call a function to do it. Um, so I'm adding a new trigger to PostgreSQL to run a function at connection time. So the basis says um, on connection trigger um, this function, whatever it's called, which will then go and do the, the work. And that's currently work in progress. I thought I'd have it finished by now, but it's not. Issues. Um, Postgres has a single user namespace um, for all databases in the cluster. So if you're using that na user namespace for a particular application, um, it could be problematic if you had another database in the same cluster that also wanted to use different users. Um, so probably better to only have one database per cluster um, if you're going to use something like this. Um, persistent connections we talked about, um, they are a problem. They can be a problem. They haven't been a problem yet, but I haven't tried it with huge loads. Um, it'll be interesting to see how it goes. Performance, obviously every time you do an insert, update, um, delete, whatever, uh, or even a select, you're going to have to run these views and these triggers and stuff, and that's going to slow the database down. Database is supposed to be good at doing this sort of stuff, so I'm hoping that there will be a performance, uh, uh, performance um, decrease, but it won't be a huge problem. Um, development and slash debugging, we talked about modifying these functions on live data is a problem. It all violates KISS, but at the same time we want to have a solution. Uh, alternatives. Introduce a new application between the middleware and database to impose access control. Um, then what lang so the lang you'd then use SQL obviously between the database and this new access control layer. Um, what what uh, connection or what uh, mechanism you use to talk between your middleware and the access control layer? You could also use SQL. You'd have to parse the SQL and then work out your access controls, etc. Or you could just use XML or HTML, so you could write that in PHP or something if you wanted to. And there's probably other alternatives. I've had a look around, I can't see anything that's terribly useful. Um, where to next? Need to investigate proposed PostgreSQL access control extensions. Thank you for pointing those ones out. Um, need to finish a real application with many simultaneous users and deploy it into production. I'm currently looking at doing that with the forums part of our um, database. And look at pushing some of the group-based access control into the database engine itself. So maybe taking some of the, those functions I showed earlier and actually encoding them directly down into Postgres um, code. The end, thanks. <laughs>